Hello, good to see you. Well, I can't see you. <laughs> anyway, for an answer to the humidity question. Basically, Roger put out the question on his channel. Uh, what's it called? Roger's Orchids? I, I still want to refer to it by the old name, but the name's been changed for a while now, so I believe it's Roger's Orchids. Something close to that. <laughs> um, he put forth the question of if humidity has nutrients in it, does that matter for getting into the plant by the way of the stomata. Okay, well, he's already put out his own answer to that. Um, I'm just going to pretend that he hasn't. He has. i seen it. I'm going to do my best to uh, pretend that I didn't see it. I, I don't recall anything in the the video that I didn't already know so that shouldn't be too hard um, I find his video pretty factual but if you already know the information you already know it <laughs> it's nothing against uh, the person it's just I, I don't recall anything I didn't already know being in the video anyway here we go. I thought at first, uh, my first take of the question, I didn't see a bear in the cave. So I was just going to dismiss it. My mind wouldn't let me dismiss it. I didn't see a bear in the cave, but Instead of my mind just letting it go, which was the intention, the old brain said, no, no, if there's no bear in the cave, why not walk into the cave and see what you can find? So that's what I did. <laughs> I thought about it some more. And, okay, evaporated water coming off of a river, lake, the ocean, my fish tank, doesn't have all of the nutrients that was in the water, at least. That doesn't happen. Uh, you evaporate salt water and you get the salt left behind in your kettle or whatever you evaporated the water in. So all those nutrients in the, the salt, and the salt itself, stays behind. And the salinity of the salt water keeps rising and rising and rising until the water's all gone and you just have your salts and your nutrients. So they all don't just go up and evaporate out. This is why you need a top-off system for a saltwater aquarium. As water evaporates out, you need to replace that water to keep the salinity uh, at a tolerable level for the fish. Okay, so there's not going to be a lot of nutrients in the evaporated water. But will there be any at all? Hmm. Okay, well, first... That echo. <laughs> anyway, first, I went and looked up what the pH needs to be in your nutrient mix for foliar feeding. Because that, in a sense, is what you're hoping to do, right? 
any nutrients that does come up with the evaporated water, you're going to foliar feed when it gets to the leaves and into the stomata. Okay, so I looked that up, and I got an answer that your foliar feed needs to have a pH of 5.8. Okay, that's something I learned because I don't deal with foliar feed. So I learned that if you do want foliar feed, your pH needs to be 5.8. Well... The question's not about foliar feeding, it's about evaporated water. So if anything, it would be the evaporated water coming off of that foliar feed mix, whatever that would be. Um, yeah. Calcium mixed with some kind of an or not organic fertilizer. Well, maybe organic, but yeah, better grow or whatever you fertilize with. And then that evaporation, what comes up with the evaporation? Probably not much. And whatever does is coming out because evaporated water, basically being pure, as we just discussed, is going to be much closer to 7 point something. Not 7.0 because nature doesn't like that pH. It's the one pH nature doesn't like. I was watching a uh, video about pH, and they had an acid in a base. I, I think I got that the right way around. Otherwise, it's a base in a uh, alkaline, but I don't think so. I think it's alkaline is base, so it's an acid in a base. And they would take the acid and they would put that in there, and you would have a very acidic uh, pH. And when it got past 7, they would put in some of the base and try to get it back to 7. And it kept jumping over and jumping over. It would go to 7, but then pretty much immediately jump past it and go to whatever direction. They could get it close, but it wouldn't stay at 7. The, the liquid did not want to stay at pure water. It kept jumping, jumping over by a, a point or two. So it's not likely to be 7 but very close to seven because it's very pure. Well, why wouldn't it be completely pure? Well, there's a couple of things I can think of that might evaporate out with the water. You've got your nitrogen gas. Now, I really don't think plants like that, but if it's a natural nitrogen, like I've got in my water, um, you know, maybe that a little bit of that natural nitrogen will come up with the water in the form of a gas, which is what the humidity is basically doing. That's the, the water coming out and forming back into a gas, really, because it was a gas before and then it condensed, came down as rain, and then it returns to gas goes back up into the clouds, and then it just keeps going around and around. So maybe some of the nitrogen will go up with the evaporated water. And well, there's ammonia gas, too. So maybe some ammonia can go up with the water. And as far as the last one goes, I watched... Another video, this is some time back, um, there were some orchid people talking about a science experiment. Now, this is the person that may have watched the original version, passing it on secondhand, 
so I'm getting third-hand information. Or maybe they heard of it from somebody who watched the original video, so maybe I'm getting, like, fourth-hand information. Yeah. If you ask a second grader about that, they will likely tell you all about the telephone game. Right? So, I don't know how accurate that information is. I'm sure I'm getting it second, third hand minimum, where the story's still kind of close to the original, but may have already changed. Yeah, that, that uh, game you learn somewhere around second grade. <laughs> um, so, I don't know. But from what I remember, and here you're getting it a step back again, but the way I remember it is there was an experiment and they were trying to determine how much boron orchids need. And I think it was Phalaenopsis orchids. Oh, sorry. I kind of jerked the, the phone. Um, but how much boron Phalaenopsis orchids uh, needed? So they were going to starve them and then, you know, slowly introduce in small amounts. Apparently, the answer gave them the, or, yeah, the answer was given a little sooner than they expected because they couldn't seem to starve the orchids of boron. They were getting the boron from somewhere. Well, this is a scientific experiment. There was none in the nutrient. And you would think scientists wouldn't uh, contaminate their experiment. They seem to think... Again, this is memory. I, I couldn't find... I did look for it, but I couldn't find the uh, video again. Couldn't remember where to go to find it. But if memory serves me, which it may or may not, they decided that the boron was coming from the glass. Like, like the scientific glass uh, scientists use. It, it's kind of like Celsius isn't a accurate enough uh, form of measurement of temperature. So they use Kelvin in scientific experiments. Well, this is, I guess, supposed to be a scientific glass that gives off no traces of anything. Yet the orchids were apparently getting their boron needs from the glass. Well, if that's the level of boron that they need, that they can pull it out of glass that's, you know, used for scientific beakers and scientific purposes, that's not a lot of boron. I mean, talk about a micronutrient. They don't need much boron at all if they can get it from glass. Any kind of glass. So, could enough boron come up with the evaporated water that they might get some boron? Well, that's three things that may or may not be in evaporated water. I don't know how you would test for it. You would have to take the water, evaporate it, and then return it to its liquid form, not allow it to get contaminated. But how do you do that if the orchids can get boron from the very glass that you would use to make sure that the water doesn't get contaminated. How could you... You can't measure it as a gas. Not within the instruments that I'm aware of. 
So, yeah, maybe some nutrients come up with the evaporated water. And I would argue that they would be small enough that the stomata of the leaves, in comparison, would be huge. And they would just go right on into the plant with the water. So my thought is, yes, maybe they do get some nutrients. You know, I, I thought of three that they might, I don't know how much they like ammonia, but they like nitrates, which has already been broken down a quite a bit by the organisms that live sort of in the water. So any nutrients that evaporate up with the gas, I would say yes, could get into the plant where the stomata, you know, the leaves, the stomata. I really don't think they could live on these nutrients. But I think that, yeah, they, they might get some trace uh, nutrients from evaporated water. But no, I... I I don't see how they would get anywhere near enough to even survive, let alone thrive. I've tried the experiment before of air plants in like 60% humidity. And they lived quite a long time, a couple of years if I remember correctly. But I think that ultimately they starve to death. And they've got pathetic roots. They get most of their nutrients by way of foliar feeding. But I suspect that the pH probably does need to be closer to 5.8 which is your foliar feed, for all of the nutrients to get in. Maybe a range somewhere in that area for all of the nutrients to get into the plant. I don't think any plant could even survive solely on evaporated water. Rainwater, yes, but not just evaporated um, going into the plant as a gas. Now, I, I think it would need to be closer to 5.8, and at those levels, I, I think you're looking at water, not uh, the evaporated gas. Because it would be leaving most everything behind. So that's my answer. Yes, I think they can get some trace elements. But it's more of a snack than a meal. Okay. I'll talk to you next time.